Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MedSynapse podcast series, where we explore the latest innovations in healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Nigar, and today we will be discussing on thyroid hormones, too little or too much. It's a true honor to have a distinguished guest guiding us through our topic today. Joining us is Dr. Tivya Sandarajan, a renowned expert consultant endocrinologist and physician in Pantai Hospital in Malaysia and prominent speaker in diabetes and endocrinology, bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience to our discussion today. Driven by a strong foundation in medical training and a notable track record of achievements, she stands as a beacon of excellence in her profession. Expanding her expertise, Dr. Tivia earned her MRCP from the University of Edinburgh in 2014. Dedicated to continuous growth, Dr. Tivia furthered her knowledge through subspecialty and fellowship training in endocrinology and diabetes with the Ministry of Health, Malaysia. Her commitment and significant contributions were acknowledged with the prestigious FRCP Awards from the University of Edinburgh. Bringing over 13 years of dedicated practice to the world of endocrinology, Dr. Tivia specializes in obesity medicine, diabetes, and thyroidology. Her wealth of experience ensures that each patient receives comprehensive and specialized care. Welcome, Dr. Tivia. Thank you, Dr. Niga. It's an honor to be on the show. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Tivia. It's an honor for us to have you on our podcast today on this very important topic. And to our audience, in this medical podcast, we will delve into the balance of thyroid hormones, exploring the clinical nuances between insufficient and excess production. Also, we will discover the key indicators aiding in accurate diagnosis and advancements and personalized treatments for hypothyroidism. We will uncover the best practices for managing hyperthyroidism and addressing the potential complications. But before we begin, I would like to ask one personal question from Dr. Tivia. With your diverse medical background, what drew your specialty to endocrinology? Could you please share a personal insight into why this field captured your professional focus and dedication? Thank you, Dr. Niga. I have always been fascinated with the field of endocrinology and it started off when I was a medical student. Um, medical or internal medicine was my second posting during my housemanship training. And um, what I realized is that endocrinology is such a diverse field that encompasses several different areas of the functioning of the human body. It encompasses electrolyte balances, metabolic functions, diabetes, blood pressure, reproduction, as well as fertility issues. And that's what made me um, curious and, and take up endocrinology as my subspecialty. Thank you so much for sharing with us your personal journey into endocrinology. We appreciate you sharing what drew you into this specialized field. And let's begin with our podcast. So the first question is, what are the key clinical indicators that help differentiate between hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism? And how can healthcare professionals use these signs for accurate diagnosis? So thyroid hormones are involved in regulating metabolism, energy production, regulation of temperature, maintaining healthy blood pressure and heart rate. So if our thyroid malfunction means it produces too little or too much thyroid hormones, causing a chain reaction of symptoms throughout our body. Now, having an underactive thyroid basically decreases or slows down bodily function, whereas hypothyroidism speeds it up. So when, as clinicians, when we see patients, it's important not to miss drastic weight fluctuations, menstrual irregularities, neck swellings, and also those who come in with metabolic syndrome. Now, these should raise a red flag for clinicians in screening for thyroid disorders. In Graves disease, which is an autoimmune disease, uh, cardinal signs are a diffuse goiter with brewy, thyroid eye disease, uh, proximal myopathy, which is clinically examined, 
fine tremor and hyperreflexia. Now, these are telltale signs during a clinical examination, which you can easily spot if you are well versed. I've seen many patients with Graves' disease. Whereas in hypothyroidism, signs are a little bit more subtle. It's not very clear cut usually. Um, so it may be a little bit difficult, but Usually patients offer a very good history when it comes to hypothyroidism, basically uh, symptoms which exhibit a slowed metabolism. Now, thyroid disorders are usually autoimmune in nature and you may have a, a variety of patients who come into you exhibiting other autoimmune diseases. So when you have this subset of patients, it's prudent to actually screen for thyroid diseases in them as well because having one autoimmune disorder increases the risk of having another. And uh, autoimmune diseases are the commonest cause of um, thyroid disease as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Tivia, for providing such valuable insights on both hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. And also our audience would like to know about the link between infertility and the thyroid hormones. Now, how can doctors identify if infertility is linked to thyroid hormones and what specific diagnostic methods or markers are commonly used to make this determination? Low levels of thyroid hormones can interfere with ovulation, which impairs fertility. In addition to that, some of the underlying causes of hypothyroidism, such as certain autoimmune diseases, or even pituitary disorders which cause hypogonadism may also impair fertility. Now, the key um, disruptor is basically abnormal TSH levels. So abnormal TSH levels generally affect and interfere with ovulation. And generally, this happens in females in the luteal phase, which is the last half of the cycle after ovulation. Now, hypothyroidism can cause disruption of the menstrual cycle which makes it harder to conceive because um, we're not really sure when the patient is ovulating. It can also interfere with ovulation and cause an increased risk of miscarriage and premature birth. In subclinical hypothyroidism where your T4 and T3 levels are normal with an elevated TSH, there's uh, always a debate in terms of the upper limit of normal, especially for those who are embarking on a pregnancy or in pregnancy. Now, it is now uh, widely accepted that this TSH level should be based on a population-specific reference range. And as endocrinologists, we advocate the use of anti-TPO testing when you're embarking on a pregnancy or in pregnancy for subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, what about um, hyperthyroidism? Hyperthyroidism also affects fertility by disrupting the menstrual cycle, causing a reduction in the sperm count for males and also increases the risk of early term miscarriage and premature birth. Um, generally speaking, uh, for patients who present with infertility, we would do a TSH level to screen for thyroid diseases before looking at other uh, hormonal imbalances such as prolactins, and then going on to do your FSH, LH, estradiol, as well as progesterone levels to see whether there are uh, indicators to, to, to say that there is a thyroid problem. Understanding the connection between the thyroid health and infertility is definitely very crucial. Thank you so much, Dr. Tibia, for shedding light on this question. The diagnostic methods mentioned, particularly the thyroid function tests and antibody tests, definitely play a very vital role in identifying whether thyroid hormones are contributing to infertility. Now, moving on to our next question, Dr. Tivia, for patients with excessive thyroid hormone levels, what are the current best practices in managing hyperthyroidism and how can healthcare professionals address potential complications? Okay, generally, when we talk about uh, hyperthyroidism in Graves' disease, treatment is given for one and a half to two years. A lot of clinicians tend to prematurely switch off the antithyroid medications when they hit the one and a half to two years mark. Now, what happens when um, the medication is switched off prematurely is the patient tends to get into a relapse very soon thereafter. So it's best that the TSH levels remain stable and within the normal range and then gradually taper down the 
antithyroid medication, be it methamazole, carbamazole, or propyl thiuracin, very slowly to avoid a relapse. Another good way to actually um, taper off antithyroid medications is to check the patient's antithyroid antibodies, being the TSI, which is a thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, or the TSH receptor antibody before tapering off the antithyroid medications. So this is where the value of antithyroid antibodies come into the picture because if you have one at diagnosis, you could very well use it when you're tapering off the medication to guide you whether or not you should stop your medication as well. Now, when we talk about complications of hyperthyroidism, pay special attention to your Graves disease patient's eyes. Look for thyroid eye disease. If you're unsure, get your ophthalmology colleague on board to actually assess um, their eyes. Get an ECG done, assess their pulse for atrial fibrillation, and also get an echocardiogram if you suspect the patient to be in failure or thyrotoxic cardiomyopathy, because treatment can be started earlier and it will reduce uh, morbidity much earlier as well. Another thing is to always discuss the options of radioiodine therapy and surgery with the patient beforehand, especially if they have a long-standing problem with Graves' disease, multiple relapses, or they have complications from fluctuations in thyroid hormones, which would cause further complications in the future. Dr. Tivia, now when it comes to hypothyroidism, how should doctors adjust treatment and keep an eye on patients with underactive thyroid to make sure they get the right amount of thyroid hormones? When we talk about underactive thyroid hormones or hypothyroidism, there are several issues. Now, as we all know, uh, thyroxine is a very sensitive medication and patients should take it on an empty stomach as it requires acid for absorption and to avoid taking it with other medications. So the timing, the, the best timing or optimal timing for thyroxine in an empty stomach is at least 30 minutes to 60 minutes before the first meal. Um, compliance is an issue with most of our patients with underactive thyroid hormones because it's a daily drug and sometimes they forget to take their medications. The next issue is that the dose of medications, they come in uh, 50 mics and 100 mic tablets, especially the ones that we have here in Malaysia. We rarely find the 25 mics. And so when we are adjusting um, the dose for the patient, sometimes we have difficulty because the patient may need 87.5 mics or maybe 100 and 150 plus 25, say 175 mics. And it's difficult to actually break the tablet. So sometimes what we tend to do is that we give doses um, accumulated or calculated on a weekly basis and we try to adjust it. For example, we give um, a dose of 100 mics from Monday to Friday and then an additional 50 mics or 25 mics on a Saturday and Sunday. So that would give us a cumulative dose that's required for the patient based on their body weight. Now, generally speaking, um, the dose required for a patient with high Active or hypothyroidism is um, 1.6 mics per kilogram. Uh, this is just a rough guide. Then we adjust the dose um, every four to six weeks. So it takes about four to six weeks to actually achieve a steady state when you're starting the patient of thyroxine and compliance as well as the way the patient takes the medication is very, very important. Now, there's another area where there's a dilemma. Should we uh, replace uh, T3 hormones in patients who are on thyroxine, which is T4. But again, the principles and decision-making in T3 replacement should be in accordance with uh, some of our guidelines, such as the British Thyroid Association Statement, etc. So combination of T3 and T4 should only be initiated and supervised by accredited endocrinologists. And these patients should be screened beforehand for other autoimmune diseases because they generally complain of lethargy and fatigue and tiredness and that's what makes us feel whether they have an issue with T3 or not. So a decision to embark on a trial of uh, T3 and T4 combination therapy for those who are already on levothyroxine should be reached following an open and balanced discussion with the benefits versus uh, risk of over-replacement and 
because we don't have uh, long-term safety data as well in this area. Now, considering the impact of thyroid disorders on various organ systems, what collaborative strategies can endocrinologists employ when working with other specialists to ensure comprehensive patient care? Thyroid disorders are generally co-managed with our ophthalmology and cardiology colleagues as patients tend to develop thyroid eye disease even um, months before they are diagnosed with thyroid eye disease. So sometimes the referral comes in to us from an ophthalmologist saying that the patient has got eye symptoms, eye manifestations, and then later on they actually find out that the patient has thyroid abnormalities. And sometimes the patients end up with cardiologists for failure symptoms, heart failure symptoms, and turn out to have thyroid biochemical abnormalities. So I think it's very important for us to work together with our ophthalmology and cardiology colleagues. Screening for thyroid eye disease is essential, if, especially if one is considering uh, radioactive iodine therapy, because um, they may need to consider steroid coverage prior to sending these patients for radio iodine therapy. Patients would also require baseline ECGs, echocardiograms to assess their cardiac status, especially if the disease is long-standing and they have had multiple relapses and fluctuations in their thyroid hormone. So I think it's a team effort and uh, we should work together in this area. Thank you so much, Dr. Tibia, for giving us that comprehensive overview. It is evident that navigating the complexities of thyroid disorders demands a team-based approach and this collaboration between endocrinologists and specialists from diverse fields underscores the interconnected nature of health. Now, moving on to our final question for the day. In the context of ongoing research, are there emerging therapies or diagnostic tools that may improve the management of thyroid disorders and how might these innovations influence the practice of healthcare professionals? I think in terms of management of thyroid disorders, the medications remain pretty much the same. However, um, in terms of benign thyroid nodules, uh, we have other alternatives these days, such as microwave um, ablative therapies, as well as radiofrequency ablative therapies for benign thyroid nodules, apart from just going for the conventional surgeries. But when we're talking about biochemical abnormalities of thyroid function, um, now we have several genetic studies that are underway to develop risk scores to help doctors to understand which patient is at risk for developing thyroid disease and uh, which treatments might work best for different people and how to avoid potential side effects for particular patients. So I think this is a very interesting area that is underway and um, hopefully soon we will be able to have a look at the risk scores uh, that are being researched to actually see how we can treat our patients better. Thank you so much, Dr. Tivia, for joining us today on MedSynapse podcast to discuss the intricate world of thyroid hormones. Your insights have been very invaluable in helping our audience understand thyroid health and its impact on various aspects of well-being. We truly appreciate your expertise and the clarity with which you have shared your knowledge with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Niga. Thank you once again, and we're looking forward to many more interesting podcasts together. And also to our wonderful audience, thank you for tuning in into this insightful conversation. If you found today's episode to be informative and helpful, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. By subscribing, you will stay updated on all our upcoming episodes featuring experts like Dr. Tivia, who bring valuable information to empower our health journey. Thank you once again, Dr. Tivia. Thank you so much. And thank you to our audience. Until next time, stay informed and stay well. Goodbye.